This is the story of Larry and Lucille, the first story of the Genealogy Treasures series by Sharon De Rousseau of Sharon D. Creations. And this is recorded July 27, 2021. I'm the family genealogist and have been working on this since the 1990s. This is just one of the amazing stories that I have found in my decades of research. This is my treasure and I would like to share it with you. And remember to subscribe to this channel for many other such stories along the way. And please like this story, it helps. This is a story from my maternal grandparents. I, I am starting this series off with this couple as their story can resemble so many others out there in the shaping of our country and how we are today of how they overcame their beginnings with the Great Depression when young children, the Roaring Twenties when young adults, the war as young parents, of how a family banded together in good times and in bad, of how they migrated in just one lifetime to bring about a better future for their children. From Utah to Massachusetts for Lucille, and from Vermont to Massachusetts for Larry. Larry was born Lawrence Lee Jewett on April 6, 1906, to Horatio Jewett and Ivy Rushford Jewett, who was born to a small farming community and logging community in Montgomery, Vermont. His father was one of the Jewett brothers who built the famous covered bridges you see all over northern Vermont. The Jewett family also owned a logging mill, and he was a farmer by trade. Lawrence was the oldest child. For some reason, there was a dispute between father and son, and Larry found his way to Massachusetts to attend Amherst Agricultural School. There were, there were speculations as to the reason for his alienation from his father, though nothing definitive has been found. Thus, due to the family dynamics, he turned to mechanics for a trade. Larry, when young, was thoughtful, quiet, and industrious. He was a hard worker raised on a farm in the wilderness of the mountains of Vermont by the Canadian border. His mother was from a French immigrant family initially from France and then to Quebec to find their way down to Vermont. My great aunt, Dinah Barber, or Auntie Gay, told me that her mother lived in the French section of Montgomery called the Gibu. I'm not sure why it was called that, and if anybody knows, please let me know so I can update this. When Larry was two, he had a younger sister born named Sadie May, who died young. Other brothers and sisters arrived after that, making a very busy household for the Jewetts, and gave them lots of extra farm hands, I'm sure. Their other children were Gladys Marion, Ruth Arlene, who died as an infant, Arnold Lewis, who died in 1940, and then there was Gyneth Barbara, who followed him down to Massachusetts to New Bedford and then eventually to Framingham, where she settled in as well. Then followed Agnes and Donald, who stayed in Montgomery, Vermont, and Charlotte, who went down to Massachusetts and Framingham. Wendell Fane, who later kept the memory of covered bridges in the family preserved for their historical registry, also stayed in Montgomery, Vermont. My family history was relayed often to me by my great aunt Gyneth, who he fondly called Auntie Gay. She had mentioned that there was a legend of her mother's grandmother named Phoebe Seymour, who was quite the scandal. It was rumored that she had a lover who hung himself in a barn nearby or on her property. However, I'm not sure of the validity of this tale. I've been researching and not have not found anything yet on that. And she also mentioned, Auntie Gay also mentioned that she heard that possibly Larry, my grandfather, might have been born illegitimate again. There was nothing to back that up, only that their parents were married a bit too soon before Larry was born. Again, they also had creatures that came in from out of state, and I believe for their own parents, they came all the way up from southeastern Massachusetts, from the North Outerboro area where I ended up growing up. They came all the way up to Vermont, so that could be a reason for the delay as well. Again, that's lost in time. She mentioned that her mother could read tea leaves and was allegedly in the Daughters of the American Revolution, though I'm still looking for proof on that as well. She told me of how her father had a dairy farm of around 500 acres. She would describe how they would make maple syrup and of how the roads were plowed by horses rolling a large log to flatten down the intense snow of the mountains in northern Vermont. She had also mentioned that a lot of them hate the French. And it's kind of funny because those that hated the French, they were French initially and genetically, and their names were anglicized. So I get kind of a kick out of that. And Canada was just right around the corner almost from up there. Lucille was born Lucille Hempel on June 10th, 1908 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Her parents were George Erskine Hempel and Emma Eliza Woodhouse Hempel. Her father was a successful businessman and an elder of the Mormon group. Yeah. Emma was a descendant of the famous handcart pioneers who arrived along with Brigham Young 
founding fathers of Salt Lake City and Lehigh and that area. He was a CEO of a stock holding company and owned a share of a mine in Nevada. George was a businessman and holder of a patent for a wrench in a factory named E and H Tool and Die in New Bedford, Massachusetts, named for Evans and Hempel. They moved to New Bedford in the early 1920s, the Hempel family. Lucille was the oldest of three. She had a younger sister named Dorothy and a younger brother named George. Their mother, Emma, was in Salt Lake City when women were finally allowed to vote. I wonder if she told her daughters about that historic moment and of how she felt. Unfortunately, that we lost the time as well. Lucille studied concert piano at Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island, and attended Swain School of Design in New Bedford for art. Her sister, Dorothy, was born when Lucille was one, and then came her youngest sibling, George, when she was six years old. They were all born in Salt Lake City, Utah. My grandmother would tell my mother how much she missed the mountains of Salt Lake City, that she used to go up every morning and see that. She attended Boston Latin for a bit, and then on to New Bedford High School. She graduated from New Bedford High School in 1927. She was a daughter to the new era and loved to dance at Charleston and other famous dances of the time. She was known as a flapper. She even had her hair cut short in rebellion. Her father unfortunately passed away in 1933, just months before the end of the prohibition. He had suffered a depression after their family money was lost in the stock market crash and died to complications of that. When the Great Depression hit, her father was not doing well health-wise, so she was the only one in the family who was able to work for them all. She left college and got a job at the Grange playing piano. In 1920, we found Larry still in Montgomery, Vermont, but by 1930, he was found on the census in Northampton, Massachusetts. Larry had to return to Montgomery to place his sister Gladys to rest on April 27, 1935. She was a nurse at St. Albans Hospital and was gravely injured from an explosion that started in the chemistry lab. Her fiancé left her due to the burns she sustained from the explosion, and she lost her will to live soon after. His brother Arnold died a few years after that, in 1940, from a birth appendix. He was just drafted to serve in the war. Larry met Lucille while she worked at the local Grange in New Bedford, Massachusetts, or possibly near Northbridge, Massachusetts. She was playing the piano for silent movies at the Grange when they met. My mother told me that they were quite fond of dancing. This love was later passed on to their daughter, her, Karen. They were married in 1939 while living in New Bedford. My mother mentioned that her mother, Lucille, was considered a spinster due to her age when married, which was considered older than the norm for that time. They were both living in Framingham when their only child was born named Karen in 1940, as mentioned. I can only imagine what a challenge that must have been for Lucille and Larry at the time when the war was looming large and living on ration cards. My mother was born two months early and was much smaller than normal, but with the love of her parents, she thrived. My grandfather was not able to go to the army due to his flat feet, and he was working for Gulf Oil Corporation at the time, possibly as a truck driver, as I found on the census. Lucille worked with her artistic talent to paint murals in the area and other commissioned artwork. My mother told me that she painted silk scarves and ties for a catalog when she was a little girl. She also knew other artists of her era, such as Norman Rockwell and even Walt Disney. Lucille was alleged to have been invited to California by Walt Disney himself, but it was not considered proper for her to go unattended by chaperones, and he was very new to the business himself. As far as Norman Rockwell, I believe he had a studio around Northbridge or so, and my grandmother would take my mother, and I believe, I believe her cousin was also in one of the paintings, as was told. Him. I have the name of the painting, but I just don't have it offhand, sorry. My grandfather, on the other hand, had decided to go in another direction than his family that he left behind in Vermont. He worked as a truck driver and even saved enough money for his own truck. My auntie Gay, or his little sister Gyneth, told me that he did not succeed in the business as he was unable to purchase more than one truck, which is such a shame, because that was something he really loved. He was a hard worker and would drive my mother anywhere she wanted to go when she was a little girl, as he just loved to drive. My mother recalls riding with him on the bus in the front while he drove a route from Framingham to Boston on the commercial and commuter bus. There was also an incident where one of his co-workers allegedly lit a cigarette around the gasoline and Larry suffered severe burnings. There was a huge explosion and I'm not sure if somebody else was killed. I'm still looking for information on that incident. They were still noticeable though when I was little, the burns on his leg. I remember watching him bandage his left lower leg before getting ready to go to bed. 
I used to come down and visit him. We, we would watch the Waltons together and Lawrence Welk. And on his little black and white TV in the bedroom downstairs, later became a guest room. My grandparents had family nearby, thank goodness. Lucille's brother George and his wife Marge were living nearby in West Barrington, Rhode Island. Larry's sister Gyneth and Charlotte were in Framingham. Gyneth married Ray Blandin and Charlotte married Clarence St. Germain, lovingly referred to as Uncle Frenchie. He also ran the Brockton Fair in southeastern Massachusetts. That must have helped tremendously during wartime. They lived happily together in Framingham and raised their daughter, Karen. My mother told me that her and my father had just moved to New Jersey in 1968, and Larry and Lucille were scheduled to visit them. However, Lucille died just a few months before. She died on July 11, 1968, at the age of 60. My mother had told me that she wanted to see her, grand her first grandchild more than anything. And she wanted to see the first man walk on the moon, but she missed both of them, unfortunately. I was born in 1970 and was her first grandchild. When I was young, my grandfather suffered a stroke and had come to live with us. He would tell me stories of his growing up in Montgomery, Vermont, and he fondly remembered that he was 12 when he saw his first car. He described it in vivid detail to me. I also remember when I was a little girl walking with him every day to visit his friend, Mr. Green, down the street. One should always be curious and proud of your heritage and for what your ancestors endured before you were even thought of. I started the series with them due to how fondly they were remembered by those who knew them in life. I was very close to my grandfather and was only 12 when he died in 1982, while in the Sheldonville Nursing Home in Rentham, Massachusetts. Though my grandmother might have died before I was born, I was often told of how much I am like her in spirit as I share her love of art, poetry, and dancing. Regardless, it is amazing how the past has been set in place for you to be born. This is my past, but I'm sure it is very similar and comforting to know that other families out there have all played important parts in shaping our destinies and the future for even our children. We do the same. The hardships and joys experienced were only remembered by their surviving family and tales long after they pass. I fondly believe that as long as the memories are preserved, that person is alive. I'm trying to resurrect a few that I've found in my research, the treasures of genealogy, and I have found quite a few. And I would love to hear tales of yours as well. I'd love to incorporate some of that because such amazing people have come before us. And it's really neat to dig in there and to find out what we're made of. It's until next time, thank you very much for watching this. And please remember to subscribe and to like this. It really sincerely helps. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.